Tonight it is number nine of the tabernacle. We're still with the labor. All right. Tonight I'm going to give you some background, historical background, like we did with the previous one. I'm going to show you, like I showed you with the brazen altar, what it depicts in real life and in, in history. I'm going to do that with the labor tonight. All right, and then I'm just going to end it off with some something prophetic. Um, but, so, I want to go and look um, how this labor functioned in the world the last hundred or so, couple of hundred years. Because remember, what did I teach you? The labor's got water in it, which is word and spirit. It cleanses us, like in baptism and the word. So, how did that apply to mankind over the last couple of hundred years? The labor. What, if, what did the labor do? That what it represents, what it depicts in, in man's walk on the earth. So, when the first reformation came, 1517 there was a couple of big names after that that uh, that played a, played a vital role in walking out what the Lord was busy doing the reason he, he used people was so that people can bring this word in so that this word can start cleansing people all right remember Martin Luther brought in saved by faith after that, the next piece of furniture is the labor. So the cleansing need to start. And then the next phase need to start. So here is four guys that played a vital role in the beginning stage after the first reformation going in. All right. We're not at the second one yet. This is still the first one, but we're going in. Because remember, the labor is not in the second room. It's still in the first room on the way to the second room. These guys, John Wesley, Charles Wesley and all of them, those are the time periods they were functioning in, in doing what the Lord gave them to do. But they were each playing a vital role in walking out what the Lord was busy revealing again on the earth, releasing again on the earth. If we look at John Wesley, if we start with him, just to give you some background, I'm not going to go through all of these names, I'm not going to give you everything, I'm just going to give you little bits and pieces so you can get the big story. I'm not going to go through every little detail that was there regarding this, but John Wesley, let's take him as an example. He was a child of an Anglican priest. He was uh, the 15th child of 19. They had big families back then. <laughs> he was the 15th child of 19. He was ordained as a priest in 1728 at the age of 25. I like to see that he walked a bit before he got became a priest, eh? at 25 only. I can tell you that he went through a lot of learning and submitting until he was ordained as a priest at age because they start way earlier. He didn't start like at 22 and then he was at 25 released to be in ministry. He was way earlier. He had a long journey before he was released to walk in ministry. Um, in 1729, the Wesley and some other guys formed the Holy Club, they called it, at Oxford. They formed a Holy Club. It's like a cell group today. You will call it a cell group today. Um, but they did it to, to deepen their spiritual life and to grow. Um, and in 1735, George Whitefield joined them. He's also a very well-known guy. He's on the list that I showed you in the beginning. Uh, these Wesley brothers that joined this club left England um, and became missionaries. All right, so they left England, went to America, to Georgia, and they became missionaries there. All right, they started operating there. In August, uh, sorry, Wesley met August Spanningberg, is his surname, Spanningberg. Who spoke to Wesley? Now he's in America. This guy he met there. And he spoke to Wesley about his personal relationship with the Lord. Remember, we're talking about new stuff they're finding as they're walking out after the first reformation. Here he meets this guy, this August guy, and he's talking about to Wesley about his relationship with the Lord. All right. Wesley, shortly after that, returned to England. And it's dated on Wednesday, 24th of May, 1738. 24th of May, 1738. 
He had an experience in his heart while he was talking. He had an encounter with the Lord while he was talking and sharing stuff. And he kind of had the revelation about this relationship thing while he was teaching. And he had a, a, a beautiful encounter with the Lord. He went back to Germany to learn more about this experience that this August guy spoke about. Because August also came from Germany and all of that. So he went back to Germany. Because remember, he met him in America, but he's originally from Germany. So he went back to Germany to go hear about more of this, that he had this experience about how does it work. Because now he heard it. Then he had an encounter with it. Now he wanted more. He wanted to know more. So he went back. And I mean, we, we talk about this so lightly, he went back. I mean, back in those days, 15 hundreds to go back from England to Germany it was a travel from Germany to America from England to America it was travel by boat it took months it wasn't a, like this it, it was a it was a huge journey that they that they decided to go on it took a lot of them to do this the group in Germany were called the Moravians that were walking in this new thing of relational stuff with the Lord um, that they were going they met a guy there, Zin Zin Dorf, was the guy that they met there, uh, that he met there. He spent time there, learned a lot of stuff, he returned again back to England, alright? And he started teaching justification by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ and our sanctification. He started teaching in that. So, sanctification by faith, justification by faith and the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, and he preached all of that with the fire of the Holy Spirit. I want you just to see how these guys were growing. How the new things were added to them as they were seeking the Lord. Um, it's, they said he traveled 250 miles on horseback after he learned all of this proclaiming the gospel. That's dedication. And we don't want to come when it's cold. And I'm not talking badly about the people that's here, but we as humans are like that. You know, when it's cold or it's too warm, we feel... Uh, I don't want to go out tonight, it's too cold. Or I don't want to go out today because it's too warm. We do that. This guy, 250 miles on horseback, and he preached the gospel. All right? Look where it started. He had an encounter. And it gave him that extra hunger. He started off growing, growing, had the encounter, went for more. Did you see also, like I always say, he had to go to get more? It takes something from you to go to, to get more. It doesn't just happen all the time just getting a download you have to engage like we spoke on Sunday go to the burning bush don't just stand and look at the burning bush you need to go to the burning bush to get the encounter if you just stare at the burning bush nothing will happen it will just keep on burning all right so um, the holiness movement of the 1700s followed until early in the 1800s this holiness movement that, that came to the earth uh, one of the big names also playing a role in this was Charles G. Finney from 1792 to 1875 in New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Ohio. He played a huge role there, again sharing all of this. And out of that, revival started breaking out. We started seeing revivals out of this holiness movement that came forth. After him came John Darby, 1800s to 1882. Uh, in the second half uh, of the 1800s, which was marked by a lot of holiness revivals that came out of that, uh, which actually later paved the way for Pentecostalism to come into the earth. In America, the Pentecostal churches came out of that movement. All right? It's funny today, you look at a Pentecostal church and then you guys think, oh, they've been here forever and what they teach have been here forever. <laughs> No, it hasn't. It only started late 1800s. It started there. All right, the Pentecostal, the Lady Pinksterkerke. They haven't been there before that. There was nothing like that before that. It's funny, you think today when you, when you think about people speaking tongues, you think, oh, it's always been there because we read it in the Bible and now people are doing it. So it's always been there. No, for 2,000 years, people didn't dare speak in a tongue because they would be crucified to the stake as being a witch. It was gone. It was not on the. You didn't find that. It only come back in the last 100, 200 years. It started coming, creeping back in. In the last 150 years, it came in. But we think when we see it today, oh, it's been here for always. It's just a thing. 
We don't realize it took a long time to come in. It took a lot of people to bring it in. A lot of people died to bring it in. And we today take it for granted and we fight about speaking in tongues or baptizing of the Holy Spirit. We don't realize people had to die to bring that thing in. I said here the Pentecostal Holiness Church was organized in 1909 in Anderson, South Carolina. What they did, if you want to look at this holiness movement, they, they really emphasized on sin. Um, they pointed out sin a lot. Focusing on pointing out sin was a really a focus of them. They focused on evangelism a lot in that time. Um, if you look after that, this is 1909, look in the late nine, in the middle 1900s how evangelism started running. Look where it was birthed. Yeah, here it was birthed. It always takes a while. Something gets birthed, it grows slowly. Right? Always works, works that way. Doesn't when it gets birthed run and everybody's following it. Um, I said here yeah, the Protestant movement dealt with justification of the spirit, the holiness movement dealt with sanctification of the soul. The Protestant movement dealt with justification of the spirit, and the holiness movement dealt with sanctification of the soul. Um, at the end of the twentieth, uh, sorry, at the end of the yeah, at the end of the twentieth century, the beginning there was um, we we saw a big rise in Pentecostalism all over the world. It started happening, and again, we think Pentecostal churches have been here for ages, and what they teach has been here for ages. It's not, it has not been, it wasn't there. Men like Charles Palmer, William Seymour, the Azusa Street stuff, we spoke about that in previous teachings. Those stuff started happening in America and all over the world. There came division in the holiness movement, um, issues around sanctification, there was problems there. But the movement moved and the Lord was busy releasing the knowing of sanctification, cleansing, being holy, labor. What was the purpose? We're talking about the labor. Don't forget what we're busy with here. Getting yourself cleansed. How many times did the priest wash themselves, did we say last time? Daily. All right? Justification and was the first piece of furniture, now we're busy with sanctification, cleansing the second furniture. You see how the Lord was busy cleansing. Alright? Don't forget why I'm saying all of this info. It's not to get you to know the info. It's to, I want you to see how the Lord's working on the earth to bring in this stuff. It just does, doesn't happen overnight. Because we as humans will not take it if it happens like that. Because we struggle to believe stuff. Paul released something and it took years to walk in that thing that he released, Christ in us, all right? So, I said, yeah, the purpose of the holiness movement was to restore the second doctrine of Christ, faith towards or upon God, to restore that, to bring that back. It was birthed in Europe, but, became, um, but grew to maturity in America, all right? It was birthed in, the, in Europe, Germany, like I said in the beginning, but it came to maturity in America. Why do you think we have all the Pentecostal churches started in America? Why do we have church today in South Africa in every country that has somebody standing in front and after he's somebody stood in front, they will go and do praise and worship and after they've done praise and worship, they will start doing the message and after the message they might still sing more and they will take up an offering. Where do you think that came from? Out of this. All right. Nobody did that before that. One man standing in front teaching. All right, it was birthed here. John Wesley was one of the biggest names promoting this holiness movement uh, that came. I said here his message was threefold. Believers baptism by immersion, sanctification and divine healing. That started being taught in the churches. Those things. Believers baptism by immersion. Because before that, what was the main thing? sprinkling on the babies and you release this immersion see it happened not too long ago and today we take it for granted being baptized 
It right. happened not long ago that these guys had to go through all these things. These guys had traveled mm, how many miles on boat, on horseback to get this thing on the earth. And today we see it as a normal thing that we just do. Sanctification being washed, the labor. That's the labor. It's all to do with the labor. To do with the labor. The labor. All right? That's what it's for. I said, yeah, the holiness movement was marked by the preaching of the word accompanied by singers, great conviction, blessings, manifestations of emotions and healings. It came out of this movement in the churches. All right? Today we see it as normal in the churches, but it wasn't normal back then. Because a couple of years before that, you were burned to the stake as a witch if you were walking in any of this stuff. All right? But the Lord waited till that stage went through and He started releasing the stuff again. And they started walking in it. The sanctification message restored through the holiness movement that came from the 1700s to 1800s um, can be defined in four, four distinct ways that came out of that. I said there is separation unto God, a purification from moral evil, the imputation of Christ as our holiness, being conformed to the image of Christ. All these things came out of this movement. So a lot of background I'm giving you here, but I want you to see these things didn't happen automatically or when you went to the church, it was always, always been in the church. There's a lot of things that happened behind the scenes to bring this stuff for us to be enjoyed today. Uh, let's look at sanctification. Sanctification. Paul's letter to the Galatians emphasizes and speaks a lot about the seed of Abram, which are Christ. Right? It starts from the seed of Abram, which are, we are in now, and it starts from Abram, and it ended up being Christ, the seed. I mean, you can do lots of teachings about the seed, how the seed started and ended up, and what the seed's about, and how does it go. Um, we are, in other words, the hairs of the seed. We are part of the seed that, that is still growing. That means you and I are impregnated with the seed that came from Abram. So if a seed impregnates you, what's growing inside of you? Christ. Like Mary. We spoke about this before. You are impregnated. The moment you get born again, you get impregnated. You have to choose when you get impregnated or when you get born again. Are you going to have that baby or that baby? Gonna, are you going to have an abortion? Today, as many Christians are having abortions after they get saved, then in the natural abortions are being held outside. I hope you hear what I'm saying. Don't let this go over your head. Today we see a lot of babies getting baptized, filled with the Spirit, born again, and then they abort what they received, that, that seed. Same what we're doing in the world, we're doing in the church. Because it's the same spirit operating in both sides. Something to think about. See, a lot of people are getting saved and then they just leave it. That, and they have excuses for it. I'm sorry, you can use whatever excuse you choose if you want to give birth to what was in you, with what you were being impregnated. Mary had a choice and she chose and said, it's okay, I will do this. When she got impregnated, when the Holy Spirit wanted to impregnate her. All right, you also have a choice. Um, so the this, this seed that we receive will keep on growing in you, Christ in you, and you will be start growing and you will become more the image of Christ if you continue doing it. Um, I said to the Apostle Paul, dealt with two issues that killed the seed. There were two big issues that you can read that killed the seed in the Bible that, that he talks about. The one is legalism, the law, Emphasized by the, Judean, the, the system of the Jews, if you want, don't understand that word, and, the, and licensing, to license lust. He says those two things, the law and lust, will make you abort this thing. All right? Will kill the seed. Will abort the seed. That's what talks, Paul speaks about in the Bible. Guess what? Today that's still the same problem. People staying in the law stuff, they abort the seed. They don't work through the Spirit. People that will walk in lust, what they want, and sin, they abort the seed. In other words, I said there, it's the flesh. Instead of the law, we, we follow the flesh. So, 
Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Um, I said your legalism will kill you. Remember the two that I got here? Let me just show you it again before we read it. Legalism will kill you. If you follow the law, the Bible says the law will kill you. All right? Your spiritual side now. All right? If you follow the law, the law's ways. But um, this, the lust, the license to lust in, in these things, this one, are even worse than the law. Will kill you easier and quicker. Way quicker. But this one is very obvious to do. Paul says it, and this is what I wanted to read you at Galatians 5.19, if you want to see what it is. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness. What's that? Lust. What is that, Lani? Lascoviousness. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, uh, variance. Uh, what is that, Lani? Yeah, but what is it? Emulations. Wrath, strives, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, rebellions, and su such like. Of the which I tell you before, and I have also told you in the time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Please, I'm not going to do this. I've done this in teachings before. That doesn't mean heaven. That means you're not going to function in the kingdom. Where is the kingdom? Here, in you. It doesn't say you're not going to go to heaven if you do all these things. Like people are taught. Oh, I can see I'm bearing some religious things in you now. I'm rattling some cages in some of you now. You were taught that's heaven. Go look at the meaning of that word. Go do study on that word. It's not talking about heaven. It's talking about a kingdom. A kingdom's got a king. A kingdom functions according to the king's rulership. All right? But these are the things that will take you out of relationship. Will abort the seed. If you walk in these things. If you get baptized, born again, and you still choose to do these things, you will not grow. You will stay in your sinful ways. I'm not saying you're not going to heaven. That's not what I'm saying. It's just the Lord can't use you. He's not going to give you responsibility because he cannot trust you. Because you, these things are important for you. Because that's why you keep on doing them. All right. So these are easy to understand. The, the last things, the last things, but they are the ones that will kill you the quickest. These things will abort the baby. So yeah, by knowing that, you all know what falls under this last license thing that Paul spoke about. This is the problems Paul saw that people fall under. 2,000 years ago, this was the number one problem. Guess what? 2,000 years later, it's still the number one problem. Why well, the people don't follow the Lord fully. And they, they stop following Him. Um, but yeah, legalism, the law stuff. Um, and it speaks about a lot of law type stuff um, and regulations that are man-made uh, to bring forth holiness. You understand what I'm saying? It's man's way of becoming holy. It's not the Lord's way. Man doing stuff to look holy. You can read in Colossians 2, 21 to 23. There's a couple of them there. I'm not going to go through all of that now. I've just got the one in Galatians 3 from verse 1 to 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Oh, I'm going to talk about that now. Look at that word there. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? That you ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ have been um, evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, ye are they now made perfect by the flesh? That's what we still see today. You get born in the Spirit, but you walk it out in the flesh. Me, myself, and I. I don't want this. I don't like this. I. All right? Why are you learning this stuff? That you can recognize it when you walk outside and you talk to a baby Christian, that you can see the problems where they are. That just means they're still a baby. They're not evil. They're not wrong. They are a baby. They do not have the understanding yet of these things. 
But it's a problem when we follow these things that we make a law and it's not supposed to be a law. The legalism is a spirit. This law thing, it's a spirit um, that is brought into a doctrine that we find in churches today. And this doctrine brings off, bring forth salvation. They do believe in salvation. This, they will have salvation. Or sanctification. But the sanctification comes through works. You've got to do A, B and C to get saved. In the Bible, the Pharisees were extremely pure. They looked very pure. When you looked at them walking in the streets with their clothes on, they looked pure. But they were corrupt inside. Works. If you follow sanctification by works, that's how you will look. People look at you and you look very good and holy, but actually you're not. Inside, you're corrupt. Uh, we must know the following. We have been sanctified by His blood. We are being sanctified by the water. We shall be sanctified in our bodies. These three things are very important. The blood sanctifies you, cleanses you. The labor to cleanse you. Remember they actually put place blood on the labor. labor. We, read, we did that in the two, three teachings ago. Before that they touched it with blood and uh, all the furniture. We are being sanctified by the water that's in the labor. And we shall be sanctified, you, in your body one day. Cleansed. Your body is not cleansed at the moment. If you don't want to believe me, you come, come talk to me next and you will see you'll have some more wrinkles on your face than you had the year ago. You're getting older. You will have sickness, illnesses. Because your body is not sanctified fully yet. But one day, it will happen and your body will not age. But we were taught it's going to happen in heaven. It's not going to happen in heaven. It's going to happen on earth. Your body is going to be sanctified fully here on planet earth to walk in. Not to take away suffer with this body and then we, we, we get a, a new body on that side only. Yes, when you die now you will get something on that side but it's, I'm talking about the day of the Lord. Let's look at perfection. Whose perfection is Jesus? Perfection in the New Testament. And, and, and um, we can read a couple of verses. Let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in His statues and to keep His commandments as at this day. All these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel and all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. Out of Zion the perfection of beauty God has shined. Hebrews 6.1 Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Do you see I'm emphasizing this word every time? The perfect one. We read about it today, Chelsea. 1 Corinthians 12. Till the perfect one comes. Right? That is not talking about the rapture. It's talking about the person to come. Therefore, leaving the principle of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Stop just staying stuck there. We need to grow to the perfect one, to become perfect. Sanctification, cleansing, labor, wash yourself clean. Um, that word perfection... In Greek is teleos. Teleos means completer, cons consummator. So when we wait for the perfection, we're waiting for the consummation of Him coming to the fullness on the day of the Lord. For the perfect one to come, to bring forth perfection, the consummator. It's talking about Jesus here. 
The end of perfection is a person, Jesus Christ. That's what it is. All right, so I've ran through this stuff because it's a lot of historical stuff and it's, it's boring stuff in a sense. But I wanted you to see, don't take the things for granted that you use and are available to you today. It, there was a whole movement on the earth to bring this holiness thing, this cleansing of the labor onto the earth again for us to stand in today. Like I said, people had to travel to get this that we are using and abusing today, seeing as nothing. For me, that's why I always, you guys that know me, I, I, I always tell you guys, somebody mustn't make fun of stuff. It's holy. People died for this stuff. People had to sacrifice. These guys sacrificed their families, leaving their families, going on these trips to go and learn about the Lord. So that you and I can have it today. So, now I want to go prophetic. The last bit with the labor, the, the prophetic side. The labor had water in it. All right? We all know that. We spoke about them. Water is a type of the Word and the Spirit. We said you must be washed by the water and the Spirit. Remember what I said Sunday? Where did Moses go and sit Sunday? On the well, on the water, when he went into the desert. And I said, when you go into the desert, where is the first place you need to visit? The well, the Holy Spirit, the water. You need that before you can go into the desert. If you don't have water when you go into the desert, you're going to die. Alright, you understand what I'm saying? So, Aaron and his sons, we said the previous time, had to be washed daily. With the, what had to be washed of them daily? Their hands and their feet had to be washed daily. Aaron points to the priests. All right? You are also now a king and a priest. Um, but remember, the hands and the feet needed to be washed. What's hands the type of? Works. What you need to do. Feet the type of? Walk. What do you walk in when you're getting cleansed? What do you do when you are being cleansed? Do you fall in the stuff that uh, Paul said? The lustful stuff? Or the legalism stuff? The law stuff? Or do you walk in Christ towards perfection? Because it's going to come out. I said, yeah, the labor is the heart of the work of the Lord. It's where everything originates from because you're getting cleansed. Becoming clean. And out of that cleanness you must walk. So that people can see you walking in this thing. Um, and it's not by you doing stuff to be clean. It's about the Spirit cleaning you. You just need to walk through the desert. The water will clean you. The Word will clean you. You just need to go there. Um, open your ears now. You cannot minister to the first and the second and the third room. If you were not cleansed. Because remember, they went in there daily. They had to be cleansed before they could do the rituals. What does that mean? You cannot minister to man and unto God if you haven't been cleansed. You guys are not getting what I'm saying. You cannot work with man. In other words, you cannot walk in ministry or help people or pray for people the whole time. And tell them what's right and wrong. If you haven't been sanctified yet, cleansed yet, you cannot walk and do things for the Lord if you haven't been sanctified yet. What did I say on Sunday with Moses? He had to be cleansed for 40 years before the Lord could use him. 40 years later, he was under the rulership of the Lord. 40 years earlier, he was under the rulership of Moses. The desert made this shift. That he walked under the rulership of the Lord. But today, when we have to do something for the Lord, we start it, we go into the desert because it's not easy, it's not nice. Anything you do with the Lord, you've got to go to the desert. Well, guys, I want to say this again. Anything you have to do for the Lord, if He calls you, you're going to go to the desert. What am I saying? It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. It's going to challenge you. Don't walk out. Go find the well. 
Go find the well, the spirit to help you cope in that thing. But you will find an excuse very easily to walk out of the desert and go back to your old ways. You've got to go to the well to meet him there, your husband. Like Moses had to meet his wife there. Like Jesus met the woman at the well when he sat on the well. Because only after that, some time later, you can walk and you will find the Lord in the desert at the burning bush. And after that, you will walk in your calling. If you don't want to do that, you will never walk in your calling. I know it sounds hard. I'm not trying to make things sound difficult. But that is how it works. If you don't go through the desert, you will never walk in what the Lord has called you to walk in. Because you need to find the one in the desert, in the burning bush. But to get to the burning bush, you first have to be at the well. And there's a time. Moses took 40 years. You're also going to take a time. Because you need to die. What did Moses have to die on, I said on Sunday? Of his Egyptian ways. You have to die from your ways. Your stuff you were taught in religion. Stuff you believe is right and wrong. It needs to die in the desert. Alright? Here, you had to be cleansed by the labor before you could minister to anything in this place, in the, in the tabernacle. Alright? So, uh, where was I here? It had to be done daily. I said, yes, Paul, Paul speaks about the washing of the word. Um, he mentions it. Paul mentions you've got to be washed by the word. He actually says it in the Bible. You've got to be washed by the word. That is why the Holy Spirit is a type of the of water. That's what Paul is talking about when he says you've got to be washed by the word. He's talking about the labor, what it represented back then, that you needed to be washed daily. It's a daily thing. It's not a, I got baptized in water, now I'm saved and I can do what I want to. No, I got baptized in water, my sin is taken away, now I'm going to be washed daily by saying, don't do this anymore, stop doing this. Don't do it this way, do it that way, stop thinking this, think this way. You're going to get washed daily if you go and wash your hands and your feet every day. What did we say is the labor made of? Can you remember? Yes. Glass and copper. Some of this stuff, all right. Where did they find the copper and the, the, the glass that made the copper? The, where did they find that? Can you remember? Mirrors. Yeah, who gave the mirrors? The woman that served. The woman that served. What do women do with a mirror? Come, you ladies. Check yourself out. Yeah. <laughs> to look what? All of you looked in the mirror before you came here. Yeah? Uh, you guys must listen, open your spiritual ears to what I'm saying. Here it was woman. What is woman a type of? Your soul. Your soul is female. The woman gave up the mirrors. You remember your spirit is male. Because your spirit and God's spirit becomes one. Your soul is female because you're a bride. And he's coming to marry that. So, these women gave up their mirrors. <coughs> the woman is the soul. I can see some of you are not still getting it. But I will explain. So, let me explain it. Who reflects in that mirror? When you looked in the mirror before you came here, who did you see? Yourself. That's the purpose of a mirror, to see yourself. But Paul says, you... In Galatians, I just read, why are you so bewitched? Huh? Remember I said that? You are, you poor Galatians, huh? you bewitched. <laughs> Umyani said this, this is not something I remember, uh, I thought out of, it was Umyani that said this. And it's, it's so classical, if you understand this. Snow White and the dwarfs. Mirror, mirror in the hand. Who's the prettiest? I don't even know the story. It's Snow White, eh? Who's the one that asked that question in the story? The witch. the witch. And here Paul says, you old oh Galatians, who bewitched you? Guys, we need to take our mirrors and give it to Moses. Like the woman back there. It's a type of something that is showing there. We need to give our mirrors to Moses. He wants to melt them. Moses needs to melt them. He wants to make a labor. But what do we do? We hang on to our little mirrors. 
because we look so beautiful in them. We think we are so good in them when we look in them. I said to the one you behold in the labor, in the mirror, is the one whose image you are carrying. I hope you understand what I'm saying. The one you behold, seeing the labor, is the one whose image you are carrying. Is it yours or is it Christ's? It's reflecting. But we see ourselves. But when we give our mirrors to Moses, and Moses takes it and he melts it, and after he melts it, he makes a labor. And after he made the labor, he fills it with water. Then the water and the spirit, which it represents, can wash you. Only then. And then when you look into the labor then, you see the word and the spirit inside that will cleanse you. But your mirrors need to go to Moses. It needs to die. Moses died. Get rid of the thing you like so much in your life to look at. Let Moses melt it, pour water on it. That water is word and spirit that will cleanse you daily. It will cleanse you. When you look into the word and the spirit, the water, the Holy Spirit, when you look into that, your face will become like his face because you will have a face to face encounter when you look in the mirror it's a face to face encounter you have there the reflection you're seeing we need to get to the place where we stop loving our mirrors and we give up our mirrors so that moses can melt them so that we can start being cleansed but if we don't do that we will not get cleansed you will not go into the next room so that, that you can step into the next furniture pieces that's still there. There's still more furniture to go through. But you cannot go there because you don't want to get washed. You don't want to get cleansed. Um, I said to you, when you see him face to face, you take on his image when you see him. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says, But we all with open face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. But we all, with our open face, behold, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as the Spirit of the Lord. Where are they looking into? This is 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 3. Where are they looking into? Into a glass. It's something that reflects. Yeah. Think of it this way. Why did Moses cover his face when he came down the mountain? You all know the story. Moses went up the mountain. He saw the glory of the Lord. His face shone like a, like a light bulb. And he had to cover it. Why did he cover it? Because he was blinding the people? In a sense. But there's more to it. Why did he cover his face? The glory was fading. Yes. He was hiding that the glory was starting to fade. He was hiding that. Who else did that? Adam and Eve in the garden. They made their own clothes. Why? Because they lost the glory. How did they try and hide that the glory was not there anymore? They made clothes. So what am I saying? Both of them were lying. It's fake. They were lying to the people, hiding from the people that the glory is fading. He doesn't want the people to see the glory is fading. Adam and Eve didn't want the people to see they, they sin. It's fake. That's what they're doing. So, what's happening today? We are looking into the mirror that we love so much as people and we see a fake image. The glory is not there. We're lying to ourselves when we look into that image because we didn't give Moses the mirror. All right? I mean, even if you look in more detail, this woman that gave the mirrors were from the tribe of Judah. And Judah stands for praise and worship. Worship. Yeah? 
That's the type of people. Why are the church, our church not full? Why is there only a few people here? They do not walk in that. Praise and joy the way they're supposed to, people. They do not walk in that. There's a lot of people that walk into salvation, but there's not a lot of people that walk from salvation to more maturity. Most get stuck just with salvation. But they don't want to go further. They don't want to grow further. All right? Why? What would we say? Because they are not wanting this thing. They're not giving the mirrors. They're not going wanting to go through the desert. They don't want to go to the desert. That's why they stay babies. That's why they're not growing spiritually. And they will make you believe they are very okay where they are. But they're not walking in what they were called in. So there will only be a few people, like in every generation, like with any, every uh, reformation before, it's only a few taking it and walking in it. Remember what we said? Normally the ones the Lord visited before will, will come against the ones walking in the next thing. Because there's always only a small group that will take the next thing and grow in it. Only a small group. That's why still today, when you talk and go deeper, it will be a small group. Because the rest don't want to give up the mirrors. They don't want to give up the law or the lust. They want to stay in those things. So they will not give it up. That's why only a few people will, will walk in this uh, and understand this. The rest don't want to go to Moses and give them mirrors. So guys, when you read about the labor in the Bible do you see how everything is written there for a reason with the ladies having given the mirrors and why it was made the way it was made and what's the purpose because you need to be cleansed you need to be cleansed to work with people if you are not cleansed to work with people they're going to see your sinful ways and we all have sin and problems I know but it's a difference in, in having sin and constantly sinning. In this. Do you understand what I'm saying? And if you're constantly staying in these sinful ways, you don't want to change the areas that you need to change. People are not going to listen to you because they're going to see you fake like Moses did. You're trying to hide. You need to wash and get washed in the Word and the Spirit daily. And the word can mean Jesus, it can mean your Bible. You've got to take all of that stuff and use it to get washed daily so that you can come become cleansed so that then the Lord can only use you. When does the Lord use you? Once you were cleansed, then He can use you to work with people and to work unto Him. To go deeper, because you still need to go to the third room in the, in the tabernacle. You still need to get there. But you cannot get there if you're not getting cleansed at the labor. What needs to be cleansed to get to the third room? Your hands and your feet. What do you walk in outside? What do you work in outside? Spiritually. It needs to get cleansed to go to the third room, to walk in the fullness that is there for us. But the labor is the one that shows if people want to go further what is today the biggest problem in churches um, is one of the biggest questions you find today is do you want to get baptized or not no I don't baptize I was baptized as a baby and they're fighting about baptism they don't realize what it's actually about it's not about just baptizing it's about cleansing to go further but they want to fight baby baptism or uh, fully grown people choosing to be baptized. We're fighting about the wrong things, but it shows you how important that thing is that we're fighting about. That's why the enemy keeps us busy fighting about the baptism so that we don't go any further. Our focus is just on where are you baptized, are you not baptized? If you're not baptized, you're lost. Huh? Some of us think that also. No, it's got nothing to do with that. It plays a vital role in your journey. But it's not the end of the gospel. So, take your mirrors, guys. Those things that you like so much to look at, that we do. Take it to Moses. Let him melt it for you. So 
So then your face, when you go and have a look in the Word and in the Spirit, will become His face, Jesus Christ. That seed of Abram, allow it to grow. Don't abort the seed. What do you call it? Don't give a stale birth. Uh, when the baby dies? Stillbirth. 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 Don't have a stillbirth, because that also happens in some believers. But a lot of believers give birth, and they think they're giving birth to Christ. And then they see they are giving birth to a dead baby. Because they were busy with the wrong things. Because there's only one that you must birth, and that's Christ. That's in you. The hope of glory. The seed from Abram. But you need to get rid of the mirrors. Alright? Because just as we and women like to do makeup and stuff in mirrors to make them look beautiful, we do that in the flesh. There's nothing wrong with makeup. It's just... We focus so much on the things that's so nice out that we like to do. We don't realize sometimes we need to get rid of that stuff. So, get washed daily. Wherever you go, in your workplace, wherever you go, go to the labor, to the Word and the Spirit, and let it wash you. That's the purpose of the labor for you today, as it was very vital back then also to be cleansed. I said to Charles today, actually, you are the priest and the king of Melchizedek. That's what you're actually standing in. Not the priest, the Levitical priest of Aaron, the Levites. That's old order. You're standing in Melchizedek's order. We want to still talk about that. That's, Melchizedek's about what it represents. The prince of peace. You need to get there. Don't worry who Melchizedek is. It's what he means. That's what we need to get to. All right. So next time we're going to... There's still other stuff I can say about the labor, but it's, it's also historical and, and different stuff. I don't want to go too much into that stuff. I just wanted you to get a, a bit of a background on how important the labor is for the Lord, that He did what He did on the earth the last couple of hundred years. Through a holiness movement, through a Pentecostal movement, He did all of this stuff. Unfortunately, like we always say, what happened? We made it religion. The holiness movement became the Pentecostal movement that became churches. Your charismatic churches we have today. And that, unfortunately, the churches, the way the churches are doing it today, is nothing like they did it back then when it started. They're the body function. Now, the pastor functions. We, we made it a religious thing. And not the body functioning. There's a time that somebody stands in front and teaches, but when the body is together to enjoy one another, the body must function. But why don't the body function a lot of times today? Because the body cannot function. Why cannot the body function? Because they didn't take their mirrors. They are not walking in their calling. They didn't go to the desert. They walked out of the desert before they went into the desert. And that's why we sometimes struggle that the body, when they get together, they cannot function because the people didn't walk into their calling. Remember Moses, I said Sunday? He had the calling. He knew he had to do this thing. But he didn't have the anointing for the calling. He had to go to the desert to get the anointing for the calling. You are called to, to walk in things that the Lord wants you to do for him. You've got the calling. But to get the anointing for that calling, you need to go to the desert and go die there. Get rid of your mirror. And now we don't do that. So now when the body gets together, the body cannot function because they are not where they're supposed to be. Because somebody's going to bring a word. Somebody's going to turn out and all this stuff. Somebody's going to bring a song and a hymn and a we don't do that because the body is not in their calling. They, they ran out of the desert. It was, it was out of my comfort zone, so I left it. That's what we do as believers. All right. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to our channel and make sure to click the bell notification button to get any notifications when we upload a new video. Stay blessed.